Thank you. Miss Liz is leading Children's Church this morning. Terry Ward is going to be leading in the month of August, but she and Danny are back at Grace Baptist today, so continue to remember them in prayer as they minister there at that church in Coleman, the Grace Baptist Church. Well, we are having an ice cream fellowship tonight, and maybe you don't eat ice cream or sweets, and maybe you're, uh, you're not supposed to be eating anything that has anything to do that might set your... Uh, it's not about the ice cream. It, uh, you know, I have ice cream at home. If, I, if it was about the ice cream, I'd stay at home and eat ice cream. It's about the fellowship. So if you don't eat ice cream, Randy says he doesn't eat ice cream. So Randy, won't you just get you a, a cold glass of ice water tonight? And you can Where drink... Why did I say that? Uh, isn't it? <laughs> okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken. That must have been somebody else. Maybe it was Andy. It must have been Andy. Andy doesn't eat ice cream. No, that's not true. Well, it's, just, it's not about the ice cream. If you, if you don't eat ice cream or cookies or sweets, if you don't eat sweets at all, still come because it's, you know, it, 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 you know if it would just be terrible for you to sit there watching me eat ice cream, I won't eat ice cream either. I'll sit there and I'll drink some water with you. But we want to just have a time of getting together. The ice cream is just an excuse. So if that's not your excuse, then just come anyway because... You don't have to eat ice cream and eat supper before you come. You won't even be hungry. And uh, but anyway, don't don't think it. To, you know, we that the only time we get ice cream is when we have a social like this and get together. Because when we get together for our, if we have a chicken uh, fried chicken supper, it's not about the chicken. It's about being together, sitting together, even if you don't eat any chicken at all. So it's about that. Anyway, come tonight because uh, it's a time when. I don't have to prepare a message. We're not going to have our regular service. We're just going to sit in the fellowship hall where the air conditioner does work. And uh, uh, we're going to enjoy talking and laughing with each other. Oh, that's my intention. That's what I hope to do. And that's what I hope that you'll come and do too. It's nothing. Uh, and, and if you think that's not spiritual, you need to get your, your uh, machinery calibrated again. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 3. We're going to be looking, continuing through. Uh, starting actually kind of boot kicking on in that chapter 4 and going through 9 with a series that I've called Hard to Kick. Hard to Kick. And uh, there, there's a guy that delivering a good kick right there. I, hopefully that was just stays and he didn't really kick him so hard that he came off the ground like that. But let's go on. Let's, let's go, we're going to be looking at some of these. Remember we came to a place in, the, in chapter 3, where Peter and John come into the temple. It's the same temple that Jesus had taught in. It, it hasn't been too long since Jesus taught there. And then later he was brought there and dragged through the streets of Jerusalem. He was crucified. He died. And then three days later he arose. Then he ascended up into heaven and he told the apostles. He says, go, start in Jerusalem, but then tell everybody what you see. Uh, so here are some uh, depictions of Peter and John going into the temple. And they came to a man there that had been lame. He'd been crippled. He couldn't walk. He had never walked. He's about 40 years old. He never walked a step, not even as a little baby. And they stopped. Peter and John stopped there in front of him. And he looked up at them because he thought they were going to give him some money. That's why he was there. That's what he did for a living. He begged for a living. It was their form of welfare. Not a very good system, if you ask me. Peter said those famous words you've probably heard. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And it says that he stood up on his feet, and immediately his limbs received strength. He stood up, he walked, and it says he began walking and leaping and praising God. Now, I was saved at the height of the Jesus movement back in 1970. It seems that the whole country of the United States the, the underculture, the subculture become obsessed with Jesus. Uh, you know, the hippies didn't really have anything that they believed in, but all of a sudden people began witnessing to these people that uh, the people at that time probably labeled as deplorables and began winning them to the, to the Lord by thousands. And I wasn't a hippie, and I never was on the hippie scene, but I, I, I think I, I listened to all the, the music of the time, and I considered myself a person of that culture, and I think back at that time, and I remember there was a, our, our youth group joined with several other youth groups and organizations one particular summer, summer, not long after I became a Christian, and we were all going down to the beaches of Orlando, down in Florida, 
and we were going to be staying at a retirement home there. It was, it was not a nursing home, but a place where, where wealthy people went to retire, and it was almost empty. There were only a few people who lived there. But the gentleman who managed and owned that place invited us to come, and so we went down about 50 or 60 teenagers. Probably about a, a dozen adults went down there, and we swarmed into that retirement center. It was, I, I don't know how to even describe it. It looked like a beachfront home, and the sand all around it and everything. It just looks very, uh, very like a beach resort, very high class. I knew right away that we didn't need to be there. They told us, don't break anything. You know, keep everything. So we were under strict orders to behave and to not destroy that place. And so uh, we would stay there. We had Bible studies. We had our lunch there. But then we'd get up in the morning and we'd go down to the beaches and we'd just swarm those beaches. I'd go out there with a bag full of magic tricks. Everybody would go around telling everybody for miles and it was going to be a magic show at 10 o'clock in front of the hot dog stand. So hundreds of people would come out. And there I was. I was just about 15 years of age, I guess. And I was sitting there in my bathing suit. Listen, when you're doing magic in a bathing suit, it's magic. It's <laughs> magic. No, nothing up your sleeve, I guarantee you. No rabbits out of the hat when you're doing that. So they would all get around me, and I would do about a 15-minute magic show, and it was fun. And then our people, it was kind of like a bait and switch, though. It was all a trick because our kids, all of the kids my age, we'd swarm around there, and we'd start telling people. I kind of gave my heads up. I said, there are a bunch of my friends here, and they'd like to tell you about Jesus. And if you don't mind, as you play in the sun today and play in the water, if they come to talk to you, uh, if you would, listen to what they have to say. So... They enjoyed the magic show, and I kind of felt like maybe we had kind of paid for a few minutes of their time by entertaining them. But anyway, I remember that uh, a lot of people were saved that week. And I remember that one evening, we had a baptismal service down, in the, down at the, on the seashore. And it's really interesting baptizing people in the ocean because you don't have to dip them. You just grab hold of them and just wait for a wave to come. And it, pfft, it just comes over everybody. And they're baptized. Well, I remember we were walking, and uh, there were, like I said, 50 or 60 of us. And after we had a nice meal, we already finished at the beach. That day. I remember we were walking through the, the beach streets, not, not in the streets of Orlando, but on those sea, seaside uh, wharf and pier streets. We were walking all along, and we were passing out tracts and New Testaments. And I remember that there were five or six girls and they were really epitomized the, the hippie look. They had, they were dressed kind of in that hippie fair of the day, had headbands on, feathers coming out of their hair, and uh, flowers uh, made into daisy chains around their, their necks and everything. And I remember that they, they, were, they had their arms over each other's shoulder, five or six of them, and they were walking and skipping and singing through those streets. And this is a song they were singing. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth, rise up and walk, walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they were walking and leaping and praising God. Pretty little girls, and I remember them. And... Uh, I'll never forget that song, and I, I probably haven't sung it in 40 years, but it was taken from this story right here. Someone uh, said, in commenting on this, uh, looking at the state of the modern church, and someone said, you know, looking at the church these days and looking at our budgets and our accounts, and everything, we can no longer say, silver and gold have I none, can we? And somebody said, no, and neither can we say, Rise up and walk. We can't say that either. Well, they spoke to this man, and boy, he just stood up in the name of Jesus. So let's look at the next slide. Walking and leaping. Now, when the Jewish leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John, I knew that they were uneducated and ignorant men. They marveled, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I remember the very first time I read those words as a young Christian. I knew a few verses here or there. I began listening to sermons. I began going to Sunday school, and I began to, I'd never been to Sunday school very much before. 
And I began to listen carefully, and I wanted to learn everything that I could, and I just couldn't get enough of it. But I remember very clearly reading this. The Jewish leaders, these same people who had crucified Jesus, they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They knew that they were uneducated and ignorant men. The King James Version said they were unlearned and ignorant men. Now that's, that's a derisive thing to say. To point at somebody and say, well I know that those are uneducated and ignorant men. But here it's almost complimentary. <laughs> I don't even like uh, to be spoken cruelly to, even if, even if in some kind of twisted way it's a compliment, or they don't intend it to be a compliment. Because this struck me, and I remember stopping reading right there and just looking at that for the longest time. They took note of them. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Have you ever had someone in conversation for some reason to send out the blue? They say, you're a Christian, aren't you? You're a Christian. How did you know? Or maybe you know how they do. Or do you attend church? Is that, is that why you're like the way you are? You, you go, you're a church person? Is that why? You're religious, aren't you? Are you religious? But oh, what a wonderful thing for someone to say if they looked at you and you were at work or maybe you were shopping together or you just met a stranger or you were riding on a bus with someone and looked over, if they looked over at you and said, you've been with Jesus, haven't you? They could tell. You know, if you spend time with Jesus, and I'm not talking about coming to church, it's good to come to church. When I got when I became a Christian, I came to church every time we had church. They had to tell me when not to come to church. You can't come to church when we're having a WMU meeting. They won't let you. Now when they have GAs or ACTs, you can't come to church. And there wasn't a law in our church that you had to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But if I was sitting home and watching television, all I yeah, you know, and this never happened, but I can imagine that I would sit there and say, now should I be, they're, they're meeting out the church, should I be here watching television or should I be out the church? Well, it was just very easy to decide which one God would want me to do. God would never say, well, I want you to watch Three's Company or uh, the Three Stooges instead of going to be with other people at church. So I, I attended church, but as, as I found out that I felt closer to the Lord Jesus when I was with His people, than at any other time. And I knew that I needed to grow and I needed to deepen in my spiritual life so that I could feel close to Jesus all the time. And if I, I, I learned from having read this verse that if I would spend time talking to Jesus and studying the words of Jesus and thinking the thoughts of Jesus as He would I would allow Him to think through me and the same could happen to you that Jesus rubs off on me. Jesus rubs off on me. When you spend time with someone, when you immerse yourself in some person, if you were a great fan of Elvis, you know, you'd be, be, find your lip would be curling up after a while, and you'd be saying, thank you very much, every time somebody helped you with something. You know, you just think about somebody, and you obsess about them, or you concentrate on them, you're going to begin to take on some of their characteristics. If you listen to their music, or you watch their films, or read their books, and so the more and more I'm, I find, and I, I say to you, the more and more and more you immerse yourself in the Lord Jesus, the more likely it is that someone might look at you and get the idea that maybe you've been with Jesus too. They took, they recognized that they've been with Jesus. Now looking at the man that was still standing with them, they could say nothing against it. <laughs> I want to talk with you this morning about hard to kick. Because they were looking at the man which was healed, saying they were trying to find a way to criticize Peter and John. Trying to find a way to, to, to destroy them, to knock them down, to, to arrest them, to crucify them. They were trying to, they were the Jewish, the religious people, the people of God, the chosen people of God. Just the very same people who had killed Jesus were trying to find a way to destroy Peter and John. 
You know why they found it hard to do? It was difficult to do because the guy that they just healed was standing right there. Not only was he standing right there, he was juggling down and, and praising God. It, it's hard to kick somebody who just healed somebody. It's hard to criticize them. It's hard to condemn them. It's hard to raise up in front of the crowd and say, these are bad people. You know, most of my experience, I'm now nearly 62 years of age, and most of my experience, most of the things that I are part of my experiential life are have to do with church. And I, let me tell you what, I have, in all the churches where I've pastored or served or preached, I've seen people like Peter and John, servants of God. And I've also seen people in the church criticizing them, murmuring about them complaining about how they served God or how they thought they ought to serve God. I see people that, as a pastor sometimes, man, I, I wish I had a dozen people like Peter and John. And yet I found that there were leaders in the church sometimes who looked at Peter and John and, and was, they were critical of them. They actually despised them. Every chance they got the opportunity, they would condemn them. If they got a chance to take a jab or say something negative, let me tell you something. It's not just about what you might say about someone who's like Peter or John. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 7 that just about any time, now listen very carefully, I want you to get this. Just about any time you want to say something negative or critical or condemnational about somebody else, almost any time you're going to be wrong. That's what Jesus said. He said, you've got a big timber sticking out of your eye, and you're going around saying, you've got a splinter in your eye, i got a splinter in your eye, i got a splinter in your eye, i got a splinter in your eye. Jesus said, look. Jesus said, let me tell you the rules here. If you're always, if you, if you ever look around at someone, and your eyes kind of scratch up, and your forehead wrinkles up, and your nose snarls up, and you say, oh, they're, they're not doing that the right way, or I don't. I don't think that they ought to be doing that. Jesus said, God's going to take that kind of judgment. He's going to use it on you. He said, with the same judgment that you judge, it shall be judged to you again. His advice was, don't be judging people. Don't be looking at people in a judgmental way or a negative way. Now, if you're ever snuffing up your nose about somebody, or you feel like you don't like somebody, it'd be a good idea to check and see if maybe you're looking down your nose at somebody like Peter and John. Somebody who actually has done something for the Lord. Who actually is obeying God. Someone who really is a true and genuine servant of God. You see, the reason they didn't like Peter and John because they've been with Jesus. And they were doing Jesus kind of things. And they felt under conviction they felt wrong. I tell you what, friends, if you point your fingers around everybody and accuse everybody of colluding with the Russians, you better make sure there's some Russians. There may not even be any Russians. If you're attacking someone or critical of someone, Jesus says, look, I'm going to take your method of looking at other people. He says, that's why I'm going to look at you. Now, if you think the blood of Jesus will save you from being a crummy Christian, you are wrong. He takes that very, in a very dark mood himself. When he looks at us, he sees the truth. Now, let's go on to the next slide. The leaders commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter answered them and says, which is right to obey you or God? You be the judge. Well, they weren't being the judge. They just were bad judges. Because all we can do is tell about what we've seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing to punish them for. Finding nothing, they're hard to kick. I, I can't, we want to kick you. We want to kick you in the teeth. We want to kick you down. We want to take you down. We want to get rid of you. We wish you would go away, but we can't do any of that because we can't find, we can find nothing that you've done wrong. Because of the people, for all men glorified God for what was done. 
The man was about 40 years old and the miracle of healing was performed. Now, if he'd just been a little baby, they'd say, take that baby home. Or if it was a little boy or a little girl, they said, get that kid out of here. But this was a, he, that's why it says here again, he was standing right there. Now, who you are and what you're about is standing right there for everybody to see you. What is it? Now, sometimes I, I have talked to people and say, well, they're just persecuting me because I'm a Christian. I, I've been working in the secular place. Sometimes, sometimes a Christian will say that. He said, I've been trying to witness to everybody on, my, on the assembly line, and they're all persecuting me because I'm a Christian. And I stopped him. I'm old enough to do that. And I said, no, they're not persecuting you because you're trying to witness it because you're annoying. You're rude. And you're judgmental. I said, that's why people don't like you. It's not because you're doing the Lord's work. It's because you're aggravated. It's because you're getting on everybody's nerves. You're not, you're not being persecuted because of your witness and your testimony. They know that what you're saying doesn't match up with the way that you live. And so they don't, they're not listening to your words. And when you try to talk to them, they're going to do anything that they have to do to get you to shut up because your life is standing right there. A lot of people who get a lot of guff for being Christians are just getting, they're just so easy to kick. They're just easy to kick. They're easy to judge and easy to condemn because it's so very obvious of what a phony they are and how hypocritical they are. These two men, Peter and John, they were saying, man, what are we going to do? I don't know, guys standing right there, what are you going to do? You know, there was a time when Jesus healed a man who had a crippled hand. Do you remember that story? And Jesus reached out and made that man's hand hold. He healed a man who had a crippled hand. But do you know what the Sadducees, the Pharisees said? He's healing on the Sabbath. <laughs> He's healing on the Sabbath. You're kidding. You mean, the, and Jesus said, I, it's a bad thing I made this man completely well on the Sabbath. Is that all you got? That's a, Jesus was hard to kick. Now let's look at another slide. I hope that you'll be hard to kick. Are, is it easy for someone to call you a hypocrite because there you are standing right there? Is it easy to call you a, a backbiter or a gossip? I'm still reminded of that old telephone conversation from God where this person was talking to God on the phone and he says, we don't gossip about our neighbors. Everything we say about our neighbors is true. Mm -hmm. Are you hard to kick? Peter and John were hard to kick. Now they got kicked. Ultimately, Peter was crucified. John actually died of old age. He was really hard to kick. <laughs> he was really hard to kick. They actually killed Jesus. But sometimes Christians just make it too easy for everybody to point a negative finger at them because they're the, they're the evidence is standing right there beside them. It doesn't matter what you may say or how you behave or how pious you present, piously you present yourself, they can see what's standing right beside you is that man who is the evidence. Let's go on to another slide. Now I want to jump, this is like the bookend, I'm going to go all the way to chapter 9 of the book of Acts, the story of when Saul of Tarsus became a Christian. Saul was breathing out threats and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, and he went to the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, arrest them. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shone about him a light from heaven. And he fell to earth and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Y'all studied this in so the children's church recently. You had the flashlights. Did you did that or yeah. Last week. They studied Saul seeing this light. They had all had flashlights shining in each other's eyes. In my eyes. Saul! Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. 
the one you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Now, there are two things I want you to see right here. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. Why? When people attack you or try to hurt you or harm you, or when they just dismiss you, or when they're critical of you or they condemn you, when they disapprove of you or what you do, Jesus takes that very seriously. You see, Saul had never even actually met Jesus until this day. He, didn't, he never met him. didn't know him. Never been introduced to him. But he'd been persecuting Christians, and Jesus said, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. There are people on Judgment Day who have mistreated Jesus' people, and they're going to stand before him, and he says, All right now, you were ugly to me your whole life, and you bad-mouthed me. You grumbled and murmured and complained. You griped and... And that person's going to say, oh, wait a minute, whoa. I never said anything like that about you. And Jesus said, as you did it in the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. I'm Jesus. I'm the one you said all those nasty things about. I'm Jesus. Now the second thing I want you to look at, he said it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Jesus was saying, hard, ain't it? Hard to kick against the pricks. Let me, let me show you something around right here. This, there's a picture of a guy, and he's plowing a field. Now this is kind of, kind of modern. He's got some wheels on it right there. And he's got him a, a, a yoke, and it's a bull, and he's plowing. An ox goad uh, we have Lightning here. He's a member of uh, Doug's family. And uh, do y'all do, do, do you have any spurs, Doug? Any spurs? Yeah. You got some spurs? Mm -hmm. I should call you and have you bring them today. Yeah. I'd like to hear. You know, I used to love those old westerns because when Cowboy Coach came in, he was all going ching, 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 ching. And I thought, you know, Cowboys always had the two guns on a big white hat. I'm like, man, thinking back on that now, that looks ridiculous. If you walked into a bar in the old west go with your spurs on, and with guns on each hip, they would shoot you as soon as you walk in the door, just because of how funny you look. But people didn't wear spurs all the time. I remember I used to have some spurs, and they had little, little stars on them, clip them onto the back of your heels, of your boots. Ching, 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 working on your spurs. Well, that's what a gold is. Now, I, I should have prefaced that, I'm sure that Doug never uses his spurs on the light. He didn't use them the other day. Spurs is something I, when I talk to people who love their horses, you really only use spurs when you're trying to break a horse or you're trying to bring a horse to, to be tamed. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like using a whip. You don't want to use a whip. And so a lot of people say, well, I, I, I never use spurs. Because what it is, they're on your feet, and you kick your feet back, or both of them. I'm not going to do that both of the legs at the same time because I'd be for too much entertainment. But you kick both your heels back into the flanks of the horse, and it hurts the horse. And it makes him do what you want him to do. You teach him that. If you, if you don't, be, don't do what I want you to do with the reins, I'll make you do what I want you to do with the spurs. Well, you know we talk about someone goading someone into doing something. What a goad it was, and, and there's not one here, but there was some armature that was attached right here, right behind the Ox calves. I don't know if that's right or not. It's hind legs. Sharp posts. And all he had to do was take that ox frame, and if the old ox was being stubborn, all he had to do is just goose it up just a little bit, and those sharp points would stick in the back of his legs, like spurs. He would prick his flesh. And so, during King James time, they were called the pricks. You know what an old stubborn ox would do sometimes? Get backwards. He'd kick. He'd get mad. And he'd kick. And he'd drive that goat three or four inches up into his back muscles. And Jesus was saying, Paul, Saul, it's hard to kick against spurs, ain't it? 
see, Paul was deeply under conviction. He was fighting Jesus. And he was fighting the people of Jesus. And Jesus said, Saul, it's, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's hard. I said, I've been, do you know that Saul, even though he would have papers from the high priest, and he was arresting people who were Christians and hauling them off to jail, that Jesus still considered that Paul or Saul, this, this persecutor, was under his control. He had him, he had him all harnessed up, and he was goading him, poking him. Where was he poking him to? Right here, the road to Damascus. And Paul had been kicking. And every time you kick, <laughs> that's the worst thing in the world you could possibly do. He's kick back. He poked his own kick back. It's hard for you to kick against the critics. I've seen people under conviction. People whom God has been speaking to. Now, if, if you never feel contrition, if you never feel conviction for your sin, if you know that you're away from God and God is not preeminent in your life, but it doesn't bother you, that means you don't have any spiritual feelings anymore. God, you don't even feel God's spurs anymore. Let's look at the next slide. Jesus was hard to kick. It was hard to criticize Jesus. It was hard to say ugly things. A lot of people still say ugly things. They call him a wine bibber, <laughs> a drunkard. They call him a wine bibber. They said that he was casting out demons through Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. They said some ugly things about Jesus. Listen, it's, it's hard to say things about Jesus that aren't true. That's why when Pilate brought him up here, Pilate placed him in front of all those people that wanted to kill Jesus. And he said, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. Listen, this sermon is not how to live a life so that you are free from condemnation or you're free from criticism. People are still going to hit you and strike you or strike out at you. They're going to say unkind and ungracious, unchristian things about you, even if you're Peter and John, even if you're Jesus. But don't make it easy for them. Be hard to kick. There are people who are still going to be dead set on not liking you. But when it comes out to it, say, well, why don't you like them? Well, I, you know, I really can't find any fault in them. Let's look at a couple of verses in close. In 1 Peter 2, 11, 12, and 15, Peter says, this is see Peter. Dearly beloved, I implore you as, as strangers and pilgrims, do not be controlled by what you want. Don't be controlled by what you want. This is what I want. I want this. I want that. Oh, that's not the way I like it because I want it like this. Your desires war against the soul. Speak honestly among the Gentiles so that when they speak against you as if they were, you were an evildoer, but you, by, you may by your good works, which are plainly seen, glorify God on the of day. This is God's will for you, so that by living well you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Peter said, live the kind of life so that people can look at your good works they might even speak of you as if you were an evil liver. They'll talk about you as if you were a bad person. But he says, people, all people got to do is say, look, you're standing right there. Silence those people with your good works. One final verse. Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Do all things without murmuring and complaining. Do you mean that Paul, the apostle, who started out as Saul of Tarsus, that he was writing to a church, and he was having to tell church members, quit murmuring and complaining. So that you may be blameless and harmless to the children of God, without need for rebuke or correction. A straight line in the midst of a crooked and first nation. Then in the midst, then in their midst, you can shine as light to the world. There are still people going to say other things about the light and the salt. They're going to call you crooked when you're straight. Here Paul says, look, be the kind of person that is blameless, harmless. The kind of person who's hard to kick. The only way I know 
of being that kind of person is to be the kind of person like Peter and John were because they were, had spent some time with Jesus. Again, it's not going to protect you from the harm of others. There are people, it doesn't matter how many people you heal or how many good things you do or how, many, how often you help people or how much you serve God, they're still going to be critical of you. You just have to go on. But don't make it easy for them. Don't walk around. You know, sometimes people say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I hear people say that, well, I'm just a sinner. Surely you're more than that. You were a sinner when God saved you by grace. Shouldn't you be a saint by now? I mean, we don't, we're don't. we never going to quit sinning. But I think sometimes when people say, well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, they're just saying, let me give you an excuse for why I'm such a lousy Christian. You've been looking at me and you see all the sin in my life. When people look at you, they shouldn't think of what a sinner you are. They ought to be impressed by what a saint you are. Be hard to kick. It'll be so easy to kick. Let me pray for you. Father, I want to be hard to kick. I want to be so busy doing good things that people find it hard to criticize me. I want to be, my life to be so filled with charity and goodness and kindness and patience. I want, Lord Jesus, so much of your life to be in mind that people find it hard to reach out and try to destroy me or harm me. Or try to bring me down, or Lord, or trying to discourage me. And I pray if there's anyone here today, Lord Jesus, they're just too easy to kick. It's just so easy to take pot shots at them. They've got a target on their back. They're like a punching bag because everybody knows, everybody that knows them, know that what they, the way they talk and the way they walk are completely different. And it's easy to throw stones at them. It's easy to kick them. It's easy to persecute them because they're just given so much ammunition. Help us, Lord Jesus, to grow and to get beyond the sinner that you one day saved. Let us be, help us to learn to be light and salt, to be believers as you trained Peter and John to be, so that wherever we go, people will say, it's obvious that person's been with Jesus. Lord, lead us, guide us, draw us to you, I can never change, even myself. I know that I can't change anyone else. I can't improve people's lives. Only you can make us better. Lift us up. Call us out. Speak to us today and work your will in our hearts and lives today. For we ask it, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.